Being in a field with Hereford cows and calves, you can see that we're going to be dealing with beef production in this programme. Now, beef cattle are found on a wide range of farms right across the country, from the upland country, through the lowlands, and even in arable farms. They're utilising grassland, forages, arable byproducts to produce beef. That's really why we have beef cattle on farms. The butchers and the supermarket trade, they have precise specifications of what they need in the carcasses from the animals. So the farmer has got to meet that need with his resources. He's got to plan his enterprise. He's got to have the right sort of cattle and the feed, the buildings and the capital to meet that need. And so we see right across the country a wide range of systems utilising all these resources to produce this valuable beef. And so we're going to see different systems on the arable farm where they're using arable byproducts. We're going to see grassland based enterprises. We're going to see some intensive enterprises where the cattle are kept inside, feeding different feeds to produce this beef. So let's go and see some of the systems. Before beef can be produced from any system, there first has to be a calf which can be reared to supply the beef market. Calves going into the various beef finishing systems will originate from two main sources. Either from suckler cows on marginal grassland and in hill and upland areas, producing calves especially for the beef market, or from dairy herds, where a proportion of the calves will be reared subsequently for beef production. A large proportion of calves going into beef production, around 60%, come originally from the dairy industry. Most dairy producers adopt in some form of specific breeding programme, using beef breed bulls with their cows to supply calves for the beef market, and hence produce extra return on their dairy enterprise. The selection of bulls, breeds and crosses involved in the production of calves is therefore an important consideration for both beef and dairy producers. Movement of calves from farm to farm as part of the rearing process is common in the beef industry and while suckled calves normally remain with the suckler herds for up to nine months before being sold for finishing, dairy bred calves are removed from their mothers after only a few days to be reared on a variety of artificial rearing systems. Though rearing of dairy bred calves may take place on the farm of origin, typically where beef production is run as an additional enterprise, most commonly today the calves are sold off the dairy farm to specialised beef producers, usually through a recognised livestock market. Many of you, I'm sure, will recognise this monument, Banbury Cross, here in the market town of Banbury in Oxfordshire. Famous not only for the nursery rhyme, but for the cattle market. And to beef farmers, the market is a very important resource. Because as we've seen, in many systems of beef production, it's necessary for farmers to buy and sell animals. Calves to be moved from the dairy farm to the beef farm suckler calves to come from hill and upland farms through to the arable areas for finishing. So lots of buying and selling, so the market a very important resource. And no better example than this one here at Banbury. So let's go and have a look at the cattle and see the market in operation. The auction market provides a natural focus for a whole spectrum of individuals involved in all aspects of beef production. Not just in connection with calves, of course, but for beef cattle from a variety of production systems at various ages and stages of development. All stock going through the market can be inspected in the pens by both the experienced regulars and the casual observer. And having been tagged and identified, animals are moved through to the sale rings where buyers can bid for them in the time-honoured tradition. This one here, Charlie, who's up, Joe, the back, and he gives you a reminder. Two hundred. 
At the ringside, seasoned buyers visually assess the quality of stock coming through to establish the going price for particular animals being bought and sold. And as with all such auctions, to any prospective buyer, a keen and experienced eye is indeed a valuable asset. Not everyone around the sale ring will be buying, of course. Some will be selling stock and keeping an eye on proceedings and the price realised for stock sold, while others may be watching the sale to assess price fluctuations or simply as casual onlookers, enjoying the traditional spectacle of the auctioneer at work. Yeah. Contract rearing of dairy bred beef calves to around 12 weeks of age is a common feature of the beef industry. With calf rearers specialising in rearing batches of calves through their early weeks before sending them on to various beef systems for the remainder of the growing period. The first three months of the calf's life are the most critical, as more illnesses and deaths can occur at this stage than at any other time. The provision of warm, dry, well-ventilated calf accommodation is essential to ensure the well-being and health of the calves through the early rearing period. While good husbandry is equally important, with a number of treatments and stock tasks also commonly carried out at this time. This is a group of Hereford Cross Frisian bull calves brought into this unit specially to rear for the silage beef system. They've come from a cattle dealer and that is an advantage in that the f all the house can be filled in one batch. They all arrived yesterday, all 30 of them, arrived late in the evening and they just had water last evening and then now, first morning, they're having their ration of milk. Fed at blood temperature and they'll only have it once a day. They are having also early weaning concentrates and hopefully by the time they're five to six weeks of age they'll be eating nearly a kilogram of that so that they can be weaned. Then the whole batch will be moved out, the pens will be emptied, cleaned, washed, sterilised and then the house left empty before the next batch arrives and that's a good method of controlling the bacteria because bringing calves from different farms could be a, a source of problems. So here we see a system, what we call early weaning, which is ideal for beef production. Systems adopted for rearing, growing and finishing the beef animal are probably more diverse than any other single agricultural enterprise, with beef production lending itself readily to integration with a wide range of other farming activities, including mixed beef and sheep, beef and dairy, and beef and arable production. The principal factor underlying all such production systems, however, is the planning of a beef enterprise which most effectively fits in with the overall use of the farm's resources. The availability of feed, buildings, labour, land, equipment, and last, but by no means least, capital. The interaction of all these factors, allied to the choice of appropriate beef breeds, influences to a large extent the selection and management of beef production systems to meet the well-established target growth patterns, live weights and live weight gains of the beef animals throughout their rearing period. Semi-intensive production is perhaps the most common of all beef enterprises, being well suited to a wide range of grassland and arable farms, with cattle housed during the winter and turned out to grass for the summer. Such systems provide a flexible means of producing finished cattle at ages ranging from 15 to 24 months on a traditionally grazed and conserved grass diet 
with appropriate cereal and concentrate supplements to maintain target growth levels and ensure that the animals are ready for slaughter at the desired age. With a higher proportion of calves in the UK born in the autumn, the 18-month beef system, with cattle being finished, as the name suggests, at 18 months of age, is the most common of the semi-intensive production methods. Though other systems, principally 15-month and two-year semi-intensive production, have been developed to cater for groups of animals born at other times of the year. The 18-month system commonly starts with calves being reared indoors during their first winter to around six months of age, grazed outside during the following summer and finished to a suitable slaughter weight and condition during their second in wintering period on a diet of conserved grass, usually silage and supplementary concentrates or cereal based feeds. Growth rates through the middle or grazing period of the 18 month system can be influenced by several factors not least of which is the management of the grass, which should be of suitable quality and quantity to meet the requirements of the beef cattle throughout the summer months. The growth of grass is highly seasonal, with half the total summer's growth often being produced in the first two months, a fact which in conjunction with the cattle requiring less grass in the early part of the season, or into their smaller dietary capacity, means that there is commonly more grass available than the beef cattle can effectively utilise. To overcome this problem and to reduce wastage due to spoilage of pasture, cattle are usually restricted to about a third of the overall grassland area in early season. Grass from the other two thirds being used for conservation, either as hay or better still silage for feeding during the winter period. Although the semi-intensive methods of production still hold sway with many beef producers and remain the most common and popular systems throughout the country, in recent years several systems of beef production have been developed which eliminate the requirement for traditional summer grazing, with beef animals being housed indoors, often in special purpose-built accommodation, throughout the entire rearing period, from arrival to sale off the farm for slaughter. Such systems are referred to as intensive and these production methods have opened up the opportunities for economic beef production to a wider spectrum of farm businesses. A number of beef producers have intensive systems. That means they keep the cattle inside the buildings throughout the year. And here you see a very good example of buildings ideal for beef animals. They have good access for the feeding vehicles from the silage clamps, they have good access for the manure vehicles that have to take the slurry out to the fields, but particularly they provide a good environment for the animals, good ventilation, and here slatted floor so that the dung falls through from the cattle and is stored below the slat and then is taken out and spread on the land. So buildings are a very important resource for intensive systems. We see the buildings here, let's go and see some of the cattle which on this farm have been set, fed on both grass silage and some being fed on maize silage. Intensive silage systems, as the name suggests, involves the production of sufficient quantities of conserved forage to produce good high quality silage for feeding to house cattle throughout the year quality of the silage is important, as this will influence the degree to which the cattle will consume and utilise the feed, and to this end, efficiency in all aspects of silage production, from cutting the grass to storing and preserving the silage, have a direct bearing on the overall efficiency of the system. The grass silage system is particularly efficient in terms of the numbers of cattle which can be finished from any given area of grassland over a given period, as compared with the semi-intensive systems involving the grazing of grass. Most commonly, the cattle reared are Frisian or Frisian crossbred animals, 
been introduced to the silage and concentrate ration at any time from around eight weeks of age through to slaughter at 14 to 17 months. And although concentrates can be fed throughout the rearing period to manipulate growth rates, high quality silage with minimal concentrate usage are the key factors to profitability in the intensive silage systems. Such efficiency is not without its price, however, as intensive production systems are in the main more costly, not only in terms of the increased numbers of cattle to be reared, but as a consequence also of the higher feed costs, capital cost of buildings and essential mechanisation or contract costs involved in providing and storing sufficient conserved rations for year-round feeding of housed cattle. Nevertheless, despite such increased outlay, intensive beef production based upon grass silage can be an attractive proposition, particularly to the arable farmer or in a mixed farming situation where it can be run as a useful subsidiary enterprise, using grass as a break in the arable rotation, while at the same time making valuable use of the manure for arable land and further utilising home-produced straw as bedding materials for the animals. As has already been indicated, intensive beef systems are based upon a number of different feedstuffs, depending principally on the resources and suitability to any particular farming situation. Indeed, intensive silage systems themselves are not always based solely on grass silage. There is also that other important silage crop, providing conserved feed for beef production, maize. This is a crop of maize being grown for silage for beef cattle. It makes ideal food for fattening animals. The leaf and the stem, and particularly the cobs, are finely chopped and made into silage which can then be fed in the winter months or even through the following summer uh, to beef cattle. It's an ideal crop to grow on a farm where there are cattle and arable cropping in that the manure from the cattle can be put onto the land, worked into the soil in the winter and then the crop is planted with a precision seeder in April or May and then it is sprayed for weeds and there's some very good herbicides for maize which will control perennial weeds so that one then comes clean back from maize into the arable cropping, usually into cereals. But for beef cattle it makes a good high energy feed, needs some su supplementation with protein, otherwise it's a very good feed. Maize requires a higher overall temperature for the seed to germinate than most of the other crops we grow in Britain. In general, the plant is sun-loving, growing best in the well-protected, preferably south-facing fields to achieve highest yields. The most active phase of growth in the plant is between mid-July and mid-August, when in one month, the maize plant can achieve nearly half its total growth. Harvesting the crop for silage making is generally carried out in September or October using a forage harvester with a special maize header attachment, following which the crop is stored and conserved in much the same way as grass silage. Target growth rates achieved on the maize system are similar to those from grass silage, though with maize silage the emphasis in providing concentrate supplementation in the diet is on protein rather than energy. Whether maize or grass silage, however, the intensive silage systems for feeding beef cattle rely on good planning and good conservation and storage of high quality material to ensure ample feed supplies for the cattle throughout their rearing period. And here's another intensive beef system, which while involving essentially similar resources in terms of buildings and mechanisation, relies on a quite different feed source, cereals. 
This is beef being produced from a basically cereal diet on an arable farm. This is the most intensive system of beef production because the cattle will reach slaughter weight in just about 12 months of age. You can, in this system, with good buildings, have entire male bulls. These are the uncastrated males, and they grow about 10% faster and convert their feed into beef about 8% better than would the castrated steers. But you do need good, strong buildings, and you need to be able to provide the bedding for the animals without going into the pen, because it would be dangerous with those bulls. But they produce good, lean carcasses and they're growing very quickly and utilizing this barley plus the protein supplement. This also has the minerals and vitamins. So you see a very fast growing system. They need to be bedded every day so that they get a little straw to help their digestion. And if the building had slatted floors, then you would have to have a diet such as this, which has got chopped straw incorporated in it because it is essential for the ruminant animal to have some fibre to help digestion. So if the cattle are buried on straw then that's fine, they can have a diet as you see here but if they're buried on slats they have to have this special diet. Now this is a system with low labour requirement, fairly high capital cost in buildings but also it is a system which does a good cash flow. You receive the money for the first batch of cattle before the next lot of calves arrive. In fact, it has the best cash flow of any beef enterprise because of the rapid growth of the cattle and the slaughter of them within the 12-month period. So this is a good example of intensive beef based on cereal feeding. Yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. With the purchase of calves and the relatively high cost of these cereal concentrate diets, accounting for a major part of the production outlay of the intensive cereal beef system, careful planning and consideration of the costings related to these price sensitive resources is essential if the enterprise is to be managed successfully and profitably. Despite such considerations, however, the system does have its advantages, with perhaps a major benefit being the capacity to provide a high energy ration leading to increased growth rates of the animals, which usually reach finished condition ready for slaughter at around 10 to 12 months of age, a relatively rapid throughput, with the added incentive that the system also provides the potential for production of uniform, consistent, high quality carcasses often commanding a premium return for the producer when the animals are slaughtered. Cereal beef production is also called barley beef owing to its common reliance on rolled or crushed barley and though it is possible for producers to rely totally on bought in cereal feed Homegrown and processed barley usually provides a proportion of the total cereal feed required for the beef cattle. This is a cereal processing plant dealing with the homegrown cereals on this farm for a beef enterprise. Now, we've said before that many arable farms carry a beef enterprise to utilise homegrown feeds for the beef cattle. And forages are used, but so are cereals. This is a very important crop on many farms. In fact, this farm is a lightland sandy farm growing good high yields of barley. And the barley is being processed through that plant, being, in this case, rolled and crushed, ready for feeding to the beef cattle. Some of the cattle are being fed on an intensive cereal-based system where they have predominantly cereals in their diet. Some are on a silage-based diet where the barley is used to raise the energy level of the diet that the cattle are having. Now, the barley in this case has been dried after harvest and been stored in this barn 
but it's quite possible to treat the barley with propionic acid to stop it going off, to keep it in good condition so that it is slightly moist and then it rolls very well in the processing plant. But in any way, it's important to get it nice and palatable for the beef cattle, whether it's being fed as a main part of the diet or as a supplement to a forage-based diet. That's cereals for beef production. In hill and upland areas, where the climate is harsh and vegetation growth poor, and even in some lowland marginal areas, beef cattle are run as suckler herds to convert low quality forage into high quality nutritious milk for their calves. While the majority of suckler herds are based on crossbred cows, running with selected beef breed bulls, some herds are based on cattle from one pure breed only with a proportion of the calves sold for subsequent breeding in other similar pure breeding herds. In the main, however, suckler calves destined for the beef market for slaughter are crossbred, with the benefits of hybrid vigour resulting in a generally improved performance with higher average weights at weaning. Suckler herds are most commonly run in hill and upland areas, however where they are usually integrated with a sheep enterprise with their complementary grazing helping in the utilisation of the poorer grasses. The breeds used in such upland systems are usually noted for their hardiness and with certain regional preferences may even be outwintered on accessible land where an adequate supply of feed can be provided for suckler cows and calves. The main objective of the suckler cows on this farm is to convert the grass and other feeds on the farm to produce these high quality calves. And they have 75% of their genes from the pure beef breeds. Their father was either a Charolais or a Limousin bull and their mothers are crossbred cows. In this case, Aberdeen Angus cross Frisian, but one could use the Hereford cross Frisian or, or many other crosses. And the cows are utilising this feed, the calves are suckling their mothers and producing this very good confirmation where we'll have a lot of meat in the high price parts of the carcass. So there you see the calves almost ready to be weaned at nine months of age and then they'll either be fattened or finished on this farm or sold to other farms for finishing. So there you see crossbred cows producing high quality calves. To produce a regular supply of wean suckled calves for sale, usually at around nine months of age, nearly all the feed required goes into the suckler cows to provide a reliable milk supply for their calves throughout the suckling period. In the early stages following birth, milk is the only feed the calves will consume. And to this end, one of the chief factors influencing the profitability of the suckler herd enterprise is cow performance and the regular production of a calf each year from the suckler cows. Managing the reproduction of the cows in the herd so that they all calve at around the same time of year, herds are usually managed to be either spring or autumn calving, makes for easier husbandry, particularly for feeding throughout the year and housing of the animals in winter. By reducing the spread of calvings in this way, calves are of a more consistent size and age at sale, making them a more attractive proposition to buyers looking for even groups of suckled calves to take through to slaughter weight on the various beef finishing systems. This is the final part of the story of beef production from suckler cows. These are weaned suckler calves from the Hereford bull 
born in Wales on a grassland farm. They were born in the spring. They spent all the summer suckling their mothers and have recently been weaned and transferred across the country to this farm in Oxfordshire. This is an arable farm where there's plenty of winter feed to finish their cattle. There's also the buildings. There is the labour availability and the farmer fortunately had the capital to be able to buy the calves onto this farm. And so they're going to spend the winter here in the final finishing period, growing quickly, putting on high quality meat. And so these sickle calves will produce some really good quality meat in the spring when hopefully the prices are high. Giving a good return to the finisher here on the arable farm and hopefully a good return for the producer of the suckle calf. So there we've seen the full story of beef from the suckler cow. Despite the preponderance of beef cross animals, which so characterise commercial beef production systems, and the attributes which such hybridisation has presented to the beef producer, pure breeding herds of beef cattle too still play an important role in the beef industry. There are many different beef breeds, each exhibiting characteristics which set them apart to a greater or lesser extent. Whatever the perceived benefit, pure breed selection and choice is influenced in many instances, not only on commercial grounds, but also by established tradition, breed loyalty and regional preference which, allied to the diversity of systems, resources and conditions influencing producers, ensures the continuing demand and survival of the range of pure beef breeds for future production and breed improvement. A number of beef producers are what we call pedigree breeders. They keep purebred cattle. They have purebred cows and they serve them with a purebred bull to produce primarily young bulls for sale because the industry needs these bulls firstly to keep the purebred and so the very best bulls go into AI to generate the new breeding stock other bulls go into the pedigree herds but a lot of the bulls are sold in usually autumn sales to dairy farmers to cross onto dairy cows and dairy heifers to produce crossbred calves because that's a very important source of calves in the industry so the pedigree breeder has got to select his best bulls to keep in his herd and others he has to sell. And they need to be walked out, exercised, keep their legs and feet in good order, and that's what we're doing now. We better keep him on the move. Come on, boy. Come on. Irrespective of the actual beef breed involved, breed improvement is a vital part of the development of any pedigree or pure breeding line. The process of breed improvement itself is necessarily a slow and painstaking task, often involving the monitoring of genetic improvements over a number of generations through carefully managed breeding programs allied to assessments of a wide range of characteristics through the established means of progeny and performance testing. This is a group of young Simmental bulls. This is another beef breed, imported from Switzerland and some from Germany many years ago and established in this country. A very useful breed for crossing onto dairy cows to produce high quality beef. And these young bulls are on what we call a performance test. They've come from different farms, they're being fed, housed and managed together in this group. They're having ad libitum feed to express their full genetic potential to grow. They were weighed on arrival and that weight was supervised by staff from the Meat and Livestock Commission, the MLC. They were here to uh, check the cattle on arrival in terms of weight. They'll come, that was when the cattle were six months of age when they started the test. They will supervise the weighing when they're halfway through the test at about nine months of age. And most importantly, they'll be here to weigh them at the end of test when they're 12 months of age and calculate their growth. These are growing at nearly two kilograms per day during this test period on a very good diet. Now that's the method of identifying the best cattle in terms of growth rate. 
and the best ones in here will most probably go into the AI organization to help produce uh, other young bulls in the breed. So they'll be used for pure breeding. But the others will most probably go into commercial crossbreeding on farms to produce crossbred cattle. Now that's performance testing. There's another testing that we do in the industry, looking at the progeny of bulls, the young steers, young heifers, the progeny, the sons and daughters of these bulls, will be weighed and recorded through their performance right the way through to the abattoirs. The carcasses will be evaluated, and then we gather all that information up to identify the bulls which are producing the best progeny. And that's what we call uh, progeny testing. So with performance testing and progeny testing, we can hopefully identify the best genetic material in a breed such as the Simmental. Through the information made available from progeny and performance testing, cattle of above average performance can be selected for the future breeding and rearing of cattle most closely matching the defined objectives of the beef producer, whose overall aim, when all is said and done, is to maintain a regular and economic throughput of finished animals, giving carcasses which satisfy the consumer market for beef. With this in mind, and with the consequent requirement to adjust and monitor feed levels and production accordingly, an essential aspect of any beef system is the emphasis on the trained eye and experienced hand of the skilled stockman to determine carcass development and condition in the beef animal throughout the finishing period, but particularly their suitability for sale off the farm for slaughter. So they're doing very well, they're getting through nicely. Oh, yeah. Pretty good job. Slaughtering and the subsequent treatment of the beef carcass is a highly organised and streamlined process, which in addition to the humane slaughter of the animals, ensures a fast and efficient throughput of carcasses to meet the demands for the various markets for beef. Abattoirs have a particularly important role to play in the beef industry, as the management of the abattoir's carcass throughput involves careful matching of supply and demand with regard to both the beef producers and the market outlets. Inside the abattoir, after slaughter, the skin or hide and the intestines, including such other meat for human consumption as the liver, kidneys and heart, commonly referred to as the offal, are removed and the carcass split into two sides by means of a very large and powerful saw. Two sides of the carcass are then weighed and inspected by official meat inspectors to ensure that carcasses passing through the abattoir are fit for human consumption. At this stage too, carcasses are generally graded according to a uniform method of carcass description and classification, which has been developed to standardise and streamline the process of grading and selecting carcasses for particular market outlets and of providing a suitable basis for a premium pricing structure for payment to beef producers according to carcass quality and grade. Having been inspected, graded and weighed, carcass sides are then moved off to the chilling rooms at the abattoir. We're now in the abattoirs seeing the animals after they've been slaughtered. And here you see the carcass of a beef animal which has been reared on a silage beef system, giving a nice coloration of lean meat and the fatty tissue as well. These animals have had the insides removed, the intestines, they've had the heart and the liver and the kidneys taken out, which will go for human consumption as offal uh, to the butcher shops. 
the carcasses themselves with either go as they are in the length they'll just be subdivided into the hind quarter where the high quality roasting meat is or the forequarter where is more of the boiling meat and the manufacturing for sausages and pies or they may well be subdivided into joints to go to the supermarkets for slicing and packaging for the customers depending on what they want. After the animal has been sewn through for giving the two halves of the carcass, they are then weighed and graded so that the producer is paid the appropriate amount. Now here is a good big heavy carcass. Over here we see a much smaller, lighter carcass. This is from an intensive cereal feeding system. This is what we'd call a barley beef animal. And we can see the much lighter color of the fatty tissue and also the much lighter color of the pinky lean meat. And there is a nice carcass, good thickness of meat, ideal for particularly the supermarket trade. So you see here at the abattoir is a very important part of the beef production story. Another week, another three weeks, yeah, okay, yeah, 4.50, yeah, and need, need a little bit more time, right, let him go then, uh, yeah. We've come to the end of the production system now, these cattle are being weighed and selected for slaughter. We've seen in the beef programme that we're using a wide range of calves, some purebred, some crossbred. And they're coming both from dairy herds and from suckler herds. And they're coming into a wide range of systems depending upon the particular farm in terms of feeding and housing and management. Semi-intensive, intensive, different systems. But they're all meeting the needs of the marketplace, which needs a range of animals, different weight, different size, different condition, and so we need the appropriate cattle and the feeding system to meet those needs. But in all the systems we need good management and good husbandry, so that the cattle will grow effectively, use their food well, so that we get care and attention to detail in all the systems. And at the end of the day, hopefully, there will then be a good return on the investment for the producer. But we're also producing meat for the meat trade and for the customers regularly and reliably. Some real good beef. Now, what sort have we got there? Uh, Limousin? He's a nice sort, isn't he? Yeah. Now, what, what condition's going on? He's a tree. He's a yeah. He's good, yeah. What's his confirmation like? Let's have a look at him behind. Quite useful sort. Yeah, what's your way? Yeah, he'll go it'll go, and he's going to the um, right. Let him come then now. Yeah, come on, stand him away. Right. Let him go. Yeah, he'll go um, to the slaughterhouse and uh, decide your guest so much a kilo for him. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, he'll go and 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 he'll go Another steer, yeah. That looks a little bit light, as well. It might, it might not quite, might not quite make it. This one, yeah. Stay another week or two. What number is he? Yeah. Twenty-four. Yeah. Four fifty-six. Yeah. Twenty-four, four fifty-six. Yeah. 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 Let him stop. Let him stop a little bit. Yeah. He'll uh, put on. What'll be doing? Kilo a day, perhaps, at this stage. Yeah, one point three, will it? Yeah, that's a good growth rate. Yeah, but they got some appetite at that age, haven't they? They're really um, kind of eating a lot of, a lot of silage and barley. yeah, barley. Yeah, they're good. Yeah, so well, yes, they're um, they're a nice bunch. How many have you got uh, selected out from this lot now, then?